What's going on people? I am B Dobbins for the win and today I am re-uploading the original Save MCC first video. Now the MCC launch in the ensuing aftermath was one of those times when a company's profits and the quality of its customers experience diverged. Ultimately the customer was shortchanged and the company definitely sweeped its failures under the rug. In the six months since this video was uploaded those of you who felt compelled to help me spread awareness of the issue have been incredibly effective. We dominated the Halo Facebook page, the Waypoint forums, and even the ultimate 343 apologist gathering, the Halo subreddit. Ultimately, we must face the bitter truth that as Halo 5's launch is nearly upon us, it's clear that the MCC will most likely not receive further support or attention, and it will of course never be the game it could have been had it been handled better. A silver lining to the announcement of Halo 5's foregoing split screen may be that it inadvertently saves MCC's playlist populations, but unfortunately with the announcement of backwards compatibility, many are left wondering whether the MCC is even relevant anymore. Perhaps it was all for naught. The point to the Save MCC First hashtag was always about forcing an uncomfortable conversation. Every gamer wants to feel a personal relationship with the developers behind the games they love. Every developer wants to make a show of caring about their customer, but it's important to remember that when push comes to shove, as it did with the MCC, when the interests of the consumer and the developer rapidly diverge, 343 will put profit above the consumer experience. And they want everyone to forget what happened here. In many ways, I think it already has been forgotten. That Hunt the Truth campaign was brutally effective at turning the page. I hope that, at the very least, this commentary can live on as a monument to the tragedy that was the MCC's launch and the impropriety in which 343 and Microsoft conducted themselves following that launch. As many of you know, in the original uploading of this video, I included a very funny interview at the end. It was three minutes long and it was copyrighted. As such, the longest and most difficult video I've ever made was hijacked. I never would have minded if I couldn't run ads on it. But through some magnificent loophole, some random radio station in Brazil was allowed to monetize my hours worth of content simply because I had a heavily edited three minute video at the end of it. I don't mind not making money, but something about knowing that these people were reaching into my pocket and making bank off of all my hard work was pissing me off. And every time I was reminded of the video, I felt irritated. So my first instinct was to simply delete the video. But partly because I put so much work into it and because so many people took my arguments to heart and went on spreading that hashtag, uh, I, I thought it would be better to ensure it lived on in some form. The truth is, this wasn't my best work. It never needed to be as long as it was. I over-explained things, went off on tangents, I was over-dramatic, and sometimes unnecessarily mean-spirited. It's important to remember that at the time, Halo had been broken for four months, and that wound was still fresh for many of us and myself especially. A lot of work and passion went into this video, and although the final product was not anything close to the masterpiece I wanted it to be, I learned a lot about myself as a writer and a commentator making this video. But ultimately, if you're a hardcore Halo fan or a hardcore B. Dobbins fan, I think you will find some value in this commentary. It's got some pretty good in-depth analysis of Halo's skill gap, the role teamwork plays in that skill gap, how playlist populations fuck everything up if they get too low, and most importantly, the clever ways in which a company tries to downplay its failures and move on. At the end of the day, it's about telling the story of the MCC's launch and how 343 shirked their responsibilities to their fans. The memory of the MCC's launch has faded, and along with it, the passions of many of the players upset by that launch. But let us never forget that in the year 2014, some fucked up shit went down, and those responsible never faced any consequences for their actions. I hope this video can live on as a monument to all their sins. What's going on YouTube, my name is Batman, and as many of you may have heard by now, over 100 days out from launch, the Master Chief Collection is finally in a state fit to launch. The beta is over, people. Pop the champagne. Now because so many of us finally have the opportunity to enjoy the spoils of this game free from the stress and frustration of 20 minute wait times in between matches and restarting the app and the hopeless hit detection and the freezes and the crashes and the failures to load, there is a palpable sense of relief among what's left of the Halo community. There has been elation and joy that finally things are working as they should, and it's completely acceptable to be happy, but what we cannot be is forgiving. I see people saying things like, let's give 343 some credit, thanks 343 for sticking with it. Phil Spencer, the head of X Fox says in an interview the day after the patch is released, and I quote, The thing I'm proud of is how committed the team is to solving this problem. That commitment to delivering what our customers want is great. If you hadn't been committed to giving us what we want after we had already paid for it, you would have been sued, you worthless fuck. 
It's like you go to a restaurant and you order some food and 110 days later, the waiter brings you your food and it's cold. Are you going to tip that waiter? Was that a satisfactory customer service experience? I'm not going to give 343 credit for finally getting their game in a launch ready state and neither should any self-respecting Halo player and let me remind you it's possible to love the game and be happy that you finally get to play it without forgiving 343 for their overwhelming incompetence. Now there is a path to redemption for 343, they can earn my forgiveness and it's been done before. If we look at Battlefield 4, it was broken at launch, DICE's reputation was destroyed, but in the end I did give DICE credit for the amount of support it gave Battlefield 4 even after the game was fully repaired, even after it had been out for a year, and there wasn't anything meaningful to gain on their end except reputation redemption. They delivered quality support that continues to this day. We just recently got a second huge CTE update that fixes or tweaks a whole lot of stuff for the better. They have committed to supporting the game even after Hardline drops. They went above and beyond repairing, and I think they have redeemed themselves in the eyes of most of the Battlefield community as well. But the question I want to dive into is can we expect the same from 343? Because judging by their behavior over the course of the last hundred days of this entire tragic catastrophe, I'm not sure that we can expect that same level of quality support. And this is an especially important question for the MCC because the nature of the launch was a million times worse than that of Battlefield 4 and has inflicted a much more severe and permanent wound. This wound is not a part of the game code and cannot be repaired through traditional methods. It's about the in-game player populations. It is a wound rooted in psychology that can only be healed through the proper atonement. And if this wound is not healed, it is going to significantly shorten the MCC's playable lifespan. I see the MCC as a ship at sea. It's built and crewed by 343. Now we all paid $60 to get on the boat and take this journey, but unfortunately, the same day the ship left harbor, it caught fire due to poor planning. Because the truth is, 343 isn't qualified to crew this ship, but it's too late now to switch crews. Now, the ship burned for 110 days before the crew was able to put out the fire. So now we have a ship that is no longer on fire. That's a good thing, the fire has been put out, but it's still wounded. Its sails are burned through, it burned holes through the hole of the ship, water is leaking in, it can stay afloat and sail a bit farther a bit longer, but ultimately it will not reach its destination, it will sink in the middle of the ocean and die a premature death. And over the course of the last four months, we have seen plenty of evidence to suggest that instead of trying to rebuild the ship, the crew is trying to sneak their way off the ship. They want to jump overboard and swim to a new ship not that far away called Halo 5. They don't want to waste any more time or invest further resources into repairing the ship they burned to a crisp. And when we, the passengers, realize that the ship we're on is doomed, 343 is going to charge us another $60 for passage onto their new ship. Now the lifespan of a game's multiplayer needs to be judged by three different statistics. What percentage of the multiplayer experience is available? How often is that percentage consistently accessible? And within the multiplayer experience that is consistently accessible, what average level of in-game quality is achieved? As a game's playlist populations decrease, so do these measurements. We know that because it was so broken for so long, the MCC has seen very serious population flight because it no longer holds a spot in the top 10 most populated games on Xbox Live. It briefly got back to spot number 10 the day it was fixed, but it has since fallen back off. This puts it behind Battlefield 4, which typically holds spot number 9 or 10. Of course, that's after Battlefield 4 has been out for a year and a half, following its own very rocky launch. And let this also put to rest all the arguments in defense of 343 that when something like this game works just fine for me, I get into matches all the time. Clearly, for the vast majority of the millions of players who bought this game, it was not playable. Because according to online stat trackers, Battlefield 4's population is hovering around 30,000, which means MCC has to have under 30,000 people online. Which means of the millions who bought the game, less than 30,000 are still playing it. There's absolutely no reason this game shouldn't still be in the top 3 most populated on Xbox Live, if not for the fact that it was broken for the last 4 months. So we don't know exactly exactly what the MCC's population counts are, because they followed the trend of many games recently in choosing not to disclose their playlist populations in a not so subtle effort to save face, but we know it has less people online than Battlefield 4. And that says a lot, because Battlefield 4 has a very low player population that has already significantly limited the percentage of the multiplayer experience that the player has access to consistently. So let's assess the state of multiplayer in Battlefield 4, keeping in mind that every problem will be much worse on the MCC. Now in Battlefield 4, Obliteration, Diffuse, Squad Deathmatch, Air Superiority, Carrier Assault, Capture the Flag, Chain Link. These 
these game modes are, for the most part, no longer a part of the game. They are not accessible to the player because there aren't enough players to fill them. The only three playlists that are consistently accessible are TDM, Conquest, and Rush, which is three out of ten playlists, or roughly one third of the game. So at this point, due to a low player population, roughly two thirds of the playlists in Battlefield 4 are unavailable at this point. And that's in a game that has significantly more players online than Halo right now. And then we can dive into that even further using the second measurement. How often is that third of the game available? Well, at its peak, you know, 6 o'clock on a Friday, it's fully available to whoever's on. Hell, at peak, maybe you can even find servers for those other less popular playlists like CTF or what have you. But then, on the other side of that, if you get on late at night on a weeknight when everyone has school and work in the morning, which is unfortunately when I typically play, then you won't even have access to that third of the playlists. When I get on, I can't even find Rush or TDM servers for any of the DLC. The only DLC game mode available to me is Conquest. So I'm restricted to certain game modes and certain maps. Maybe sometimes I can play, you know, this map pack, but not on any of these game modes, or I can play this game mode, but not on any of these maps. I'm restricted from the full multiplayer experience. Now, what I could do is expand the regions in my search. So if I expand to East, US, Europe, and Australia, maybe I'll find one air superiority match. But then if I play that match, it's most likely going to be negatively affected by the third measurement I was talking about, which is the level of in-game quality because the server might not fill up all the way you know I see like a lot of 40 out of 64 servers these days which means a less exciting match than originally intended by the devs and if I'm connecting to Australia or Europe or even in some cases the East US when I'm in West US there's likely going to be some lag and rubber banding and bullshit deaths I don't understand and an increased chance of lagging out of the game altogether so all of these problems that are already taking a toll on the overall quality of Battlefield are much bigger problems on the MCC now and they are only going to get worse as the MCC population continues to decline. And this is a point I really cannot emphasize enough, and it's something I think we all understand, that the multiplayer experience requires a pool of multiple players to pull from. And the smaller that pool of players becomes, the less of that experience you have access to. If you get on Halo 3 on the Xbox 360, you aren't going to have access to the full multiplayer experience, because you won't have access to the majority of the playlist, because there aren't enough players to fill most of them. And what experience is left will be of a significantly lesser and often more dysfunctional quality than originally intended at launch. The ranking system can't function properly because there aren't enough people to fill the lobbies with seven other people of your same rank. Matchmaking times are very long, and depending on the time of day, you might not be able to find a match at all. And oftentimes, the matches you do find are incredibly laggy because the only other people online were at very far distances that even a dedicated server has trouble compensating for sometimes. Low playlist populations ultimately take a toll on the quality of any multiplayer based game. There's a reason we so often refer to low populated games as quote unquote dead. Because once you take away a game's playlist populations, it loses a lot of its functionality because so much of the game's quality, so much of the time put into these multiplayer games revolves around being able to play with and against other people. The tragedy of the MCC debacle that needs to be addressed is that at this point, even after it's fully repaired and fully functional, it's still going to die a premature death because the MCC is already suffering from many of the same problems that Battlefield 4 and Halo 3 on the 360 are suffering from. But the problem is both those games had their time in the limelight. Halo 3 has been out for six years and Battlefield 4 has been out for 16 months. They both had at least 12 months of full functionality with all playlists readily accessible any time of the day with minimal lag and average matchmaking wait times. The MCC has only been out for four months and of those four months there's not been a single day when the game was fully functional. There's not been a single day when the MCC multiplayer player experience was fully accessible to the player, and because of that, playlist populations have bottomed out. And because of that, those players who do remain on the game may never get access to the fully functional multiplayer experience, because there are not enough people left online for multiplayer to work the way it's supposed to. And the low playlist population problems are much more severe on the MCC, not only because the MCC's population is much lower, but also because of the nature of the MCC itself. Everyone is talking about ranking systems right now, right? We desperately need a ranking system. But guess what? It's not going to work even if they put it in. Halo needs a working ranking system in a way that other games don't, because the first three Halos have enormous skill gaps, because they come from a time before COD cracked the casual code. In my prime on Call of Duty, I was a 2KD player on Black Ops 1, MW3, and BO2. But even then, I regularly got owned by 1KD players because it's so easy to kill people. All you have to do is see them before they see you. There's very little recoil. There's zero bullet delay. You don't have to lead your shots. There's so little health that even if you're badly damaged, it's not hard to kill someone at full health. 
weak players can kill strong players. Not as often as a strong player kills a weak player, but it is consistently possible. Even when I had a great 2KD game, I was still usually taking at least double digit deaths. But that's just not how it is in the original Halos. There is such a fat skill gap in Halo 3 just in like the BR fights by themselves. Leading your shots, headshot accuracy, ensuring that each shot in the burst hits. Then there's all the map specific stuff. Every power weapon and every vehicle has its own learning curve. Halo is the kind of game where the skill gap between two players can often be wide enough that the weaker player cannot kill the strong player even once. And when you get matched with a player who destroys you in ways that you immediately recognize you cannot stand a chance against, you stop having fun and you most likely end up quitting. I'm featuring a guy in this montage, Tommy Koss, dropping these fat ass Kilimanjaro no scope sniper clips, right? If this guy goes up against a new player that maybe got into Halo with Halo 4 but was pretty young when Halo 3 came out and didn't play, that new player is not going to get a single kill on this guy. And the problem is that's exactly what's happening across Halo right now because there's no ranking system. But even when they implement a ranking system at this point, there won't be enough players online to consistently match everyone in the same ranking brackets. You have really experienced skilled players getting matched with weak, inexperienced, or even brand new players and the result is a bloody massacre that infuriates the less experienced players who don't enjoy getting the shit kicked out of them, or it infuriates experienced players who get teamed up with the inexperienced players and can't carry them. And that's another one of those big things that was very different about these old Halos as compared to games these days. Nowadays, TTKs are so low that one person can hold their own against an enemy team while their own team is getting shit on. Nowadays, they forced the I into team. But in H2 or H3 Slayer, if the other guys on your team are getting steamrolled, you're gonna get steamrolled with them. You're not gonna be able to control power weapons. This isn't the kind of game where you can walk into a room and take on four bad guys by yourself like you can in COD. Once you start attacking one guy, you'll alert the other three to your position and they'll find you and kill you. Either right after you get your kill or even before, and that's just not how it is in COD or even Halo. If you start killing someone, that kill cannot be interrupted in Call of Duty. In Halo, it takes so long to kill someone that that kill Kill can be interrupted. If they run away and one of their teammates comes to save them, it's very possible. Teamwork mattered a lot more when these original Halos were made, and because of that, your fate, the joy of the match, the in-game quality, is directly tied to the ranks of your teammates and of your enemies. Because even on the other side of things, it eventually bores the veterans who don't want to spend every match beating up on kids who seemingly can't find their joysticks and inevitably quit out halfway through the match. Because that's the other thing about games with skill gaps like this, and games in general back then before COD changed everything. It was about the competition, it was about the experience, but nowadays it's about the reward, the accomplishment. In Call of Duty and every other game now, steamrolling kids who don't stand a chance against you is fun. But that's not how it was in H3, H2, it's not fun to steamroll in Team Slayer. To spend most of the match looking for players that you easily and instantly destroy once you do find them. You want to fight. But the problem is, even when they implement a ranking system, it's not going to change much at this point. I think there will be a decrease in the amount of just straight up blowout matches, but ultimately populations are so low that in most playlists, most of the time it's not going to be able to consistently match 8 players of the same rank or 16 in big team battle. Even the Halo 2 Anniversary playlist, which has had ranking from day 1 and is one of the more popular playlists, has trouble consistently filling matches entirely with players of the same general rank bracket. The small player population is going to be divvied up between the playlists. The more popular playlists might have better working ranking systems, but like I said, you know, H2A is already having troubles, and the bigger problem is the less popular playlists, which I'm guessing you're like, you know, Team Snipers, SWAT, Halo CE, H2C. These playlists are going to have to make do with what little population they have. The rate at which you get evenly matched lobbies is going to get lower and lower as time goes on. It's going to have to put you with whoever it can find that is in a close enough proximity to you that the lag compensation is manageable. There's still going to be very serious disparities between the ranks of players getting put into the same matches. And that's assuming you're playing on a schedule that is congruent with the typical 9 to 5 schedule that most adhere to, right? Like for instance, like I said, my recreational hours are usually later into the night, like around midnight. But if it's midnight on a school or work night, I'm screwed. I'm not going to be able to access most of the playlists on the MCC, and in those playlists I can access, there's still a very good chance I get put with someone who's 30 ranks above or below me. I hear everyone saying they want a ranking system, but at this point, even when they implement it, it's not going to change much, unless they start consolidating playlists significantly, which would suck ass too. And we've already seen this, kind of. Uh, when they released this latest fat patch, one of the small changes they quietly implemented, they lowered BTB to 14 players instead of 16 meaning they were worried about BTB's ability to scrounge up enough players for each match, and they increased the total player count in Rumble Pit from 8 to 10, which means that they were able to fill up those matches, but with odd men out. It means it's filling up Rumble Pit matches, but then there's a few people left over, not enough people to fill their own Rumble Pit match, but too many to fit in the handful of matches taking place, which means those odd men out have to wait for an entire match to finish before they can find one, because that's how few people there are in the playlist at this point, and obviously that dramatically increases wait time, so they bump it up to 10 to alleviate that problem, but there's a catch, 
much, and that is that on many of the smaller Rumble Pit maps, 10 players fucks up the spawning. You have people spawning right in front of you and whatnot, on a map like Warlord or Lockout. So big team battle matches already don't get to play with full teams, and Rumble Pit has terrible spawning now because 343 is already having to make small adjustments to account for the extremely low playlist population. This is exactly what I'm talking about. The quality of the experience is being degraded. We're already seeing the symptoms. This minor change in my eyes is like a sniffly nose before pneumonia sets in and kills its host. And another part of what I suspect exacerbates the problem with the MCC is that just due to its nature, its playlist populations are going to be much more diluted than a game like Battlefield. In Battlefield, most of the players naturally gravitate towards and congregate within Russian Conquest. In COD, it's TDM and Domination. But in the MCC, the player base is much more divided. Not only between playlists, but between entire games, right? There's a huge portion that only wants to play Halo 3. There's another portion that only wants to play H2A. There's a smaller portion that only wants to play CE. And then, of course, you have the typical divisions between teams Slay and Rumble Pit and BTB and whatnot. And that also means that as a playlist dies, players are going to be missing out on exponentially more than when a playlist dies in other games. When the Squad Deathmatch playlist dies in Battlefield, it's not a huge deal. Most people didn't give a shit about it, and that's why it died in the first place. But in Halo, when the Combat Evolved playlist dies out, you know, that's like 20% of the game that is no longer accessible. That's 20% that's very unique and not replicated in the other playlists, unless, of course, it's voted for in BTB or what have you. And, even worse, imagine what happens if they start releasing paid DLC, which would split up the player base even further between those who own it and those who don't. This game won't even be able to survive its own DLC, assuming there even is any. I'd be surprised if they didn't have a DLC plan to begin with, but I imagine now they've probably had to scrap a lot of it, because in theory, had the game been working from the day one, the first DLC pack would have come out by now, but they had to spend that time fixing the game, and now they gotta work on the free compensation, and most of the studio is still building Halo 5, so it might be that they just scrapped a bunch of the planned DLC, which is very unfortunate, but we'll probably never know the particulars of such a thing, because they're not gonna open up about that. But I digress. What you also have to keep in mind is that large chunks of the population still left on the MCC, and whatever fraction of that population is in your playlist, aren't necessarily gonna be in your region a lot of the time, and if you get paired with those players, it's gonna be very hard to maintain a consistently stable connection. A fraction of the remaining player population is in Australia. Another fraction is in the UK and West Europe. Another fraction is in Canada. Even West Coast US can run into problems connecting to East Coast US. And what's the result? Lag. And that's not something 343 can patch. Now they've gotten the deadies up and running at this point, and to their credit, they are very high quality servers, but even then, a dedicated server can only reconcile so much distance. I'll show you an example of the kind of lag that I suspect will become more and more common as time goes on. This is post-patch. The standoff example is late at night on a school night when I typically play. The Team Snipers example is about 6 o'clock on a Thursday, and that's a pretty high traffic time to be on. But the problem is, Team Snipers isn't an especially popular playlist just because it's kind of hardcore. We're already running into this type of lag at times when we shouldn't be. And the frequency and severity of laggy matches like this will only get worse as time goes on and the playlist population gets even lower. If I play later in the evening, I run into at least a couple noticeably laggy matches every session. And I have very good internet. I have the best package Comcast offers. Here's my speed test. This is just because at a certain point, if it's 2 in the morning on a Wednesday and the Team Sniper's playlist is in the triple digits in terms of playlist population, someone playing, you know, in Australia is going to have to connect to a server off their continent most likely. The Australian players' packets are still going to be filing through the broadband cables on the bottom of the ocean to a server in the US or West Europe, while for those of us in the US or West Europe, the show must go on. And that's where you get these sort of in-game player delays. Either one person gets shit on, or the entire match, everyone in the match, gets a sort of minor delay to accommodate that one person who can't keep up. And that's assuming that that kind of cross-regional connection is even possible. Uh, I know it can be done in Battlefield, but my understanding is that for most Australians, they're still having a lot of trouble finding multiplayer matches in this game and the really sad truth is that uh, you know Australians might never be able to play the multiplayer because there just aren't enough Australians on after four months of an unplayable game you know non-americans are the ones who are going to get fucked over by this the most and I understand that at a certain point every game inevitably has to face these problems and following these problems every game eventually has to die but this is much too soon for what should have been an epic masterpiece of the ages I suspect these examples were on the dedicated servers just because these matches were able to run all the way through while experiencing this consistent level of lag, and I feel like a peer-to-peer -peer system would have lagged out of the match entirely, it wouldn't have been able to maintain that. It was really crisp and consistent lag, I'll put it that way. Uh, but we do know that not every match is playing on dedicated servers. I've seen several host migrations post-patch. We noticed to a certain extent it is peer-to-peer, -peer, and peer-to-peer can run into serious problems, you know, even when everyone connecting is in your region. 
One way or another, low playlist populations are going to adversely affect the integrity of players' connections, hampering the overall quality of their experience. Even now that the game is fully repaired, it will continue to suffer from increasing amounts of poor hit detection, of people lagging out of matches, and thus screwing the whole match up because there's no join in progress. Of double animation bullshit where you think you've reloaded your gun, but oh wait, your guy has to do it again just to make sure. Now the worst part is that these problems with lag in the ranking system lead to quitting and quitting hurts Halo more than it does other games. People don't want to get stomped on, people don't want to play a laggy match, and so they quit. Quitting is a major problem now that the game is fixed, because they know they don't necessarily have to wait another hour to find another match. And quitting is killing the game. This goes back to the teamwork thing. Playing a man down hurts you so much more in Halo than it does in COD. Because in COD, you can take on four guys by yourself with the gun you spawned in with. In Halo, you just can't. What it comes down to is that shield recharge time. If you get into a gunfight and win, the enemies who you fought, his icon was went from yellow to red. His teammates saw it. They're alerted to your position. They're coming after your ass. And they're going to get there before your shields recharge. Or if your shields do recharge in time, you're going to have to take on several guys by yourself because you're playing a man down because there's nobody else there to draw their attention or fire. Maybe if you have a shoddy and a sniper, but that's assuming you're really good and you're able to control both those power points, which is unlikely, it becomes much harder to win when you're playing a man down. And if you're a man down because the guy who quit did so because your team was already getting beat up on to begin with, well, then you're even more screwed than you already were. And the players who didn't quit on that team recognize that and quit themselves. And then the match is over before it even reaches the halfway mark and all eight players in the match get screwed. And in general, it's just not fun to play a 3v4. That's not how the game was intended to be played, but it seems like a majority of the matches being played right now end up with at least one person quitting and thus hurting the quality of the match for everyone else involved. And what's driving that quitting is the lack of a ranking system because people don't want to get beat up for a whole match. And the ultimate tragic irony of this whole thing is that even now that the game is fixed, matchmaking times are still going to generally be pretty long. Even now they are much longer than they should be this early in a game's lifespan. It should be instant. It, you know, there are going to be people who say, oh I found a match in 30 seconds, that's way too long. It should be fucking instant right now. Um, but it's not. And 20, 30 seconds isn't so bad, but pretty soon they'll be as long as they were when the game was broken. You're gonna have to wait for kids to finish the match they're already in before they can get matched with you, and they are only gonna get longer because the population is only gonna get smaller. Right now, this game is supposed to be in its prime. When the populations are already this low, what happens after Hardline and other first-person shooters and other games in general start coming out, each one taking a little bite out of what little is left? And worst of all, it becomes a vicious cycle. Long matchmaking wait times, laggy matches, which quite often result in blowouts because of the huge disparities in player ranks, matches that basically die out because of people quitting. This results in a significantly degraded, unsatisfying, and frustrating experience for those players still playing, which makes them that much more likely to eventually stop playing the MCC altogether, which lowers the playlist populations even further, and thus makes those underlying problems of rank, lag, and wait times even worse, which lowers the playlist populations even further and makes the problems even worse, and on and on and on. It's a cycle that's already well underway, and simply fixing the game isn't going to halt this cycle because the player populations are already way too low, as low as they would be if this game had already been out for a year. And we know that even great games that are working well from day one inevitably lose huge swaths of their player population naturally just as time goes on. This game has serious playlist populations right now, but by the time we reach summer, the end of summer, everyone's experience, regardless of what time they're playing, will be on par with my limited, ungratifying experience when I play at midnight on a school night. And of course, what happens after the sequel comes out? If you get on any Call of Duty game after its annual successor comes out, you'll see it's already unable to offer the full multiplayer experience. You can't find a hardcore match, you can't find hardpoint or CTF matches, matchmaking times are long, the game lags much worse and much more often than ever did before. And that's on a game that was very popular and launched in a working state. That's on a game that remained in the top 10 most played on Xbox Live until its sequel came out. Just imagine the devastating effect Halo 5 will have on the MCC population when the MCC population is already so low. And these problems, or at least the severe of these problems have absolutely not been solved by simply fixing the game. I've heard people say that the populations will pick back up and everyone will return now that the game is fixed, and I wish that were too, but I just don't think that's the case. For one, because 343 is sort of suffering from the same problems as the boy who cried wolf. You tell people there's an update coming out for the MCC, there's a good chance they roll their eyes at you. There have been so many updates and patches at this point that players have put so much hope and faith in, starting with the update that went out the Friday after launch and for four months after, and none of them ever really brought this game up to a level of quality that would be acceptable for launch, over a hundred days out from its launch. This game was still not anywhere close to being fit to launch in the first place. They fixed it now, but there's nothing to indicate to a casual observer that this update is any different than the last 13 before it because 343 isn't making a big deal about it because that would only draw attention to the fact that the game was broken this long in the first place. 
If they were serious about saving this game, they would make a big fucking deal about this last update that really solved all the problems once and for all. But they aren't. They just released the same small, skimpy, quiet, vague update on the Halo Waypoint forums that says the exact same thing that the last 12 before it said. There's nothing to indicate that it is special or significant in any way. It just talks about fixing, you know, matchmaking stability issues and stuff like that. They aren't making a lot of noise because they don't give a shit about saving the game. Their top priority is salvaging what's left of their reputation so that they can sell you Halo 5. That means fixing the MCC, but not drawing attention to the fact that it needed to be fixed in the first place. There's been at least four or five separate occasions where I and many others got onto Halo thinking, man, okay, this time's gotta be the time that it works, and it doesn't. In their announcements and updates, they always say the same shit. Improvements to matchmaking times and stability fixes for matchmaking functionality. These things they say were always mostly bullshit for the first 12 updates. Not that there wasn't ever any improvement whatsoever over the course of those updates. You know, if you played by yourself, you could find matches fairly consistently, but you still had to deal with long matchmaking times, still had matches that failed to load, you still had game crashes, or you might get into a game where other players' games freeze or crash, which gives you uneven teams, and because of the nature of Halo's skill gap, the team playing a man down is almost always going to lose, and because of that, the other players playing a man down just give up and quit too, and it was only a 4v4, or actually more likely a 3v3 to begin with, and so the match is over before it even really starts, and then you still still had all the in-game problems like H2A and H2C, hit detection were fucked up, you got anti-aim assist in CE, you got serious respawn bugs where you get stuck on the respawn timer for like a full minute before it respawns you. And then if you played in a party, not only did you have to deal with all the shit I just talked about, but you generally had to restart the game several times throughout your session because the game still could not maintain parties from one match to the next, and then once the party falls apart, it still thinks you're all in the same party, so you can't invite people back to your party to restart the party, so you have to restart the fucking game. These very serious game-breaking problems persisted despite all the patches and the community updates preceding them that said the patches were going to fix things. And because of that, most people are very skeptical of 343's quote-unquote fixes. And there's nothing special about the latest updates to suggest how meaningful this fix actually is, so nobody that doesn't follow this issue closely is even taking it seriously. Is this the player's fault for being too optimistic and thus too let down about a product working 100 days after they paid $60 for it? No, it's 343's fault for not coming out in the very beginning and being upfront with the community from the get-go about the fact that it was going to be a long time before this game came out of beta. Everyone believed the patches would change things, 343 should have been honest about the fact that they wouldn't, because now nobody outside of the hardcore Halo community following this issue closely believes that this patch has changed anything. Many people think the game has been given up on entirely, which actually isn't very far from the truth. But of course they couldn't be upfront about any of this stuff, because their primary focus is now and has been since the beginning of this entire debacle pushing the MCC out before Christmas in order to move MCC copies, but more importantly Xbox Ones, taking the hit for a launch they had to have known would fail, and doing their best to aggressively limit the PR fallout from this colossal disaster so that they are still able to move along with their Halo 5 plans as if nothing happened. Now, even worse than the fact that most people have little faith in this coming update is that even more people just don't give a shit. It's no big secret that the FPS community has a short attention span and a vociferous appetite. That's why every shooter is annualizing Battlefield Hardline is going to come out within a few weeks of this major patch. Even under normal circumstances, that would take a chunk out of other FPS playlist populations. The majority of the 15 to 20 million players who are regularly buying FPS games annually have moved on. They're not out there checking Halo forums to see when the next update is. They aren't getting back on the game every couple of days to see if there's been some improvement. The only information they may have seen or heard regarding the MCC in the last three months is some really damning news articles from various gaming news outlets that don't paint any kind of pretty or optimistic picture, because there was none, or maybe they've seen some very negative comment sections reflecting the burning hot rage of what's left of the Halo player base. Plenty of other people simply returned the game. And again, most of these people who aren't following the game anymore aren't going to come back now that it's fixed because they aren't going to hear about it when the game is fixed. Because 343 isn't going to try and make a super big deal out of it finally being repaired because they don't want to emphasize in any way that it took this long to get it fixed in the first place. The only place the majority of people not following this closely are going to hear about it being repaired is through word of mouth from any friends they have that are still actively following the game. But even then, word of mouth is rendered almost useless when it has to overcome the whole aforementioned boy who cried wolf mentality, which is pervasive and persistent among anyone who has tried to play this game in the last hundred days after hearing about a new patch that ultimately didn't fix jack shit until, until the very, very last one. The MCC will be dead after Halo 5 drops, period. 
Anyone who bought this game will have had maybe two to three months starting with this latest big patch that finally put this game in a state to launch where the game was both working and the population was high enough so that you could access any playlist at any time. Not just the most popular ones, which I'm assuming are like, you know, H2A, Team Slayer, BTB. Without most of your matches devolving into rubbish because of horribly mismatched ranks or lag or both. Two to three months where the matchmaking times aren't absurdly long because of how few people there are. Two to three months where every match starts with full teams because there's enough players to fill them. Two to three months, and that's being generous. And even then, when fall comes around, the game will be dead. Halo 5 will obviously take a huge chunk out of what's left on MCC, very likely a majority of whoever was left on the MCC. And then on top of that, you're going to have like two or three other major FPS shooters launching in the fall, as always, including Star Wars Battlefront and the new COD. Not to mention all the other major non-FPS launches, I'm sure there will be like a new Assassin's Creed or Fable or some shit. Once all those games are released, what's left of MCC's population will be wiped out and you'll only ever be able to find matches in H2A and Team Slayer and maybe BTB if it's the right time of day. But at that point, even in those playlists, you'll often have to play with less than full teams, there will be lag, there will be hopelessly missed match ranks that cause people to give up and quit out of matches, ultimately ruining the match itself. This game has, in the absolute best case scenario, another six months of life left. And in those six months, there will maybe be two months where it can offer the full multiplayer experience in a fully functional state. Two blissful months sandwiched in between four months of an unplayable game and four months of a game whose populations are too diminished to provide the full spectrum of what we paid for. This is a game based on the sheer amount of content within that I had planned on coming back to for years to come, and I know I'm not the only one who feels that way, but at this rate, that won't be an option. Gentlemen, I come to you today to say it is not enough. If 343 has any respect for the millions of people who bought this game, if they have any respect for the Halo franchise itself, if they value the legacy of the original Halo titles embedded within the MCC, those titles which change the nature of gaming and many gamers' lives, then they will do more than just fix the Master Chief Collection. They will save the Master Chief Collection from a premature and inherently unfair demise that is the product of their incompetence and greed. Unless this game is saved through aggressive efforts to repopulate the multiplayer, then by Christmas the multiplayer will be mostly unplayable most of the time. Not because it is broken, but simply because there's nobody left to play with. And the grim reality of this situation, our primary obstacle, is that based on the manner in which we have seen 343 conduct themselves over the last 100 days, it is pretty obvious that they don't want to save it. For quite a few reasons. The first being that there's no more money to be made on the MCC. Even fully operational games see the vast majority of their sales during launch and Christmas. By March, most games aren't moving significant numbers of copies anymore. That's when they start trying to push DLC, but obviously 343 isn't in a position to make money on DLC because they haven't had time to develop any DLC because they're still developing the game itself and once they finish developing the game they have to work on the free launch compensation. Not to mention DLC would only make the playlist population problem even worse. And if they really tried to sell DLC on this game, I really think it would ignite a firestorm. Like, that would really piss a lot of people off. And even when they do fix it fully, it won't do much to repair the hit their reputation has taken. So the return on investment for them on any future work put into the MCC is going to be very low. Any money they spend on this game at this point is money essentially being thrown away. They're not going to earn that money back by spending it on this game. And they know this. They know it's not profitable to throw good money after bad. And because of that, they have decided to basically cut their losses by, first of all, only sinking the bare minimum amount of money into salvaging the MCC as possible. And they're only doing that for the sake of their reputation. And secondly, by doing their best to make sure fixing the MCC doesn't interfere too much with their plans for Halo 5. For instance, if they had to divert any amount of resources or manpower away from building Halo 5 towards fixing the MCC, they would be losing money on the hours those developers spend fixing MCC or porting that pathetic amount of compensation. Hours which they have to be paid for, that pay is a net less profit because they aren't going to see any return uh, on, the, on the developer's time spent working on the MCC. This is about cutting losses. This is about aggressively minimizing the fallout from the MCC launch. Their goal here is to lose as little money as possible to this fuck up. No doubt the failure to launch hurt their profit margins, but I guarantee you they still turned a profit on this game. And like I said, this game has seen a majority of its sales already. The only way the terrible launch could inflict any more meaningful damage on the MCC profit margins is by the amount of money spent recovering from it. Now the MCC launch could still damage the Halo 5 profit margins in two separate ways. The first being PR. Their reputation 
interpretation and how that calculates into people's decision to purchase Halo 5. And what I was just talking about, if the MCC were to in any way impact the marketing campaign or development of Halo 5, they don't want to have to push back their planned marketing schedule or betas or release date because of the MCC launch because that would negatively impact sales. And so they have it. Want to see what 343 was doing while you were trying to find a match? This is in December. This is the studio head Josh Holmes and apparently the majority of the development staff dicking around in the parking lot, choosing teams for a Halo 5 tournament. Not one match, mind you, a tournament consisting of many matches put on by the developers. So they spent that day playing Halo 5 for the cameras. Meanwhile, the MCC is still literally unplayable at the time. We've been seeing more updates about Halo 5 than about the MCC. We hear from 343 about how they are working your feedback into Halo 5, and that just seems unjust to me. Here's a quote from the related 343 blog on Waypoint. Late last year, we gave you a first look at the future of Halo multiplayer with the release of the Halo 5 Guardians multiplayer beta. This was a huge endeavor for everyone on the Halo 5 Guardians team. The only huge endeavor they should have been concerned with in December was getting the MCC up and running, but they're not because it's important they contain the damage of the MCC launch by not letting it affect in any way their Halo 5 plans, when the truth is all work on Halo 5 should have been put on halt on November 12, 2014. The beta should have been delayed. Three months out from launch, the MCC was still not performing at a level that would even be acceptable for said launch. 100% of studio resources and manpower power should have been dedicated to fixing the MCC as quickly as possible, and short of that, delivering the ODST campaign compensation as quickly as possible. Both these things have taken a very long time, and I can't help but think that this game might have even been fixed by now if they hadn't run the H5 beta as scheduled, because I'm sure the beta required a significant amount of support, because they themselves called it a huge endeavor. Now this is the part where you say, but Batman, they weren't working on MCC to begin with. It's not their fault, it's an entirely separate team. I don't give half a shit if the 343 Halo 5 team isn't a part of the 343 MCC team. If they can build Halo 5, I'm sure they could have helped repair some of the issues in MCC, because there has been such a wide range of very serious problems, not only with matchmaking netcode, but the UI in general, the campaigns, Forge, the in-game multiplayer. You're telling me they couldn't assist with any of that to get this game fully operational that much faster? This game was built by six different development studios, and after that, you're telling me that two teams from one development studio can't help fix it? And if they really, really just cannot help fix the game for whatever reason, then they should be working on the ODST campaign to get that compensation content out as quickly as possible for all the customers they fucked over. After Battlefield 4's messy launch, DICE halted all production on future DLC and games. That means two separate studios, both DICE LA and DICE Stockholm, including a separate team within Stockholm that had begun working on Battlefront, stopped working on whatever bullshit they were working on, and they all contributed to help fix Battlefield as quickly as possible. This says a lot, especially when you consider that compared to the catastrophe that is MCC, the Battlefield 4 launch was a walk in the park. This game could have been fixed faster but they didn't want to divert the resources. But 343 doesn't want to go that route. If they were to divert any manpower from Halo 5 to MCC, they would be losing money on the hours they have to pay the developers for fixing a game that isn't going to make any more money. For them, at this present juncture, the MCC is nothing but a burden, and they want to abandon it. They are anxious and excited for the day when they no longer have to talk about it, because this is all about cutting losses. My best guess for how they've handled this is that they had the MCC team instead of working on what would have been future paid DLC because I'm sure there was a paid DLC plan in place. My best guess is they just canceled some paid DLC and had those guys instead work on fixing the game and then the compensation. But they have not in any way diverted anything from Halo 5. They have not diverted any resources from the Halo 5 marketing or the Halo 5 development to contribute to fixing the MCC as quickly as possible or delivering that compensation for the fucked up launch as quickly as possible. This is about Cutting losses. Outside of messing up their Halo 5 schedule, the only way the MCC debacle can hurt their future profits is through PR. So they are asking, well, what is the best and more importantly, most cost effective strategy they can employ to minimize as much as possible the PR damage inflicted by the MCC so that the negative PR doesn't translate to less sales for Halo 5? We know what answer they came up with. And that is basically to pretend that the MCC never existed. The MCC has been defined by its launch, and they can't change that. They want people to stop paying attention to the MCC. They want people to forget about the MCC. They absolutely do not want people talking about the MCC. They want to move on as quickly as possible, and that's why they haven't stopped aggressively trying to hype Halo 5. Their ultimate hope is that by the time Halo 5 launches, nobody will be talking about the MCC, and as many people as possible will have forgotten about the terrible launch. So how do they go about this? Step one is for 343 themselves to 
to talk about the game as little as possible, and that's what they did. That's the reason they were silent 25 days out of every month. It went from silence one week in November, to two in December, to three in January, to three and a half in February. In that same time, they've posted dozens and dozens of videos and updates about Halo 5. They have that entire, again, like I just said, they have that entire series chronicling the development of Halo 5 on their YouTube channel. Meanwhile, everyone who was still holding out for hope for the MCC was waiting anxiously and desperately for any sort of information about when the next update would arrive and what went wrong in the first place. And we got nothing but silence for the most part, and those few updates that we did get were stupidly vague. Most of them provide so little information it defeats the entire purpose of the update itself. They're distancing themselves from the issue slowly and steadily. They are letting people forget about it. By the time Halo 5 comes out, there will have been all these other game releases. Kids will have been through an entire school year. We'll have all been through another year in the era of super ADD social networking, where we're absorbing so much information every day it's hard to keep track of what happened last month, much less last year. They want the MCC launch to be a distant memory, and anytime they release an update talking about when they are going to fix the MCC, they were reminding everyone that the MCC is still broken. And they don't want that, so we don't see updates. And the updates we do see are intentionally vague, and almost always spend half the update talking about Halo 5 beta stats. And by the way, don't let them fool you. The H5 beta was not necessarily a stunning success. If we compare it to the H3 beta back in the day, the average playtime per player was 12 hours less on Halo 5 than it was for Halo 3. A million people played it, doesn't mean the most of them liked it. Now, I also think the strategy of silence is why they canceled the CU beta, right? They were going to beta test the huge uh, update that came out on March 4th that ultimately fixed the game, similar to what Battlefield did with the CTE, but they canned that idea because they said the, the beta was going to slow things down. So they skipped it to get the update out faster, but that doesn't make sense to me. The entire point to letting a large pool of players beta test something is to speed the testing process up. I'm skeptical that skipping that step sped the process up by much. In fact, I think this might be why ultimately the fix was delayed, because the update had to get tested by someone, and I guarantee you it takes a lot longer for a small team of developers to test everything than it would a large pool of players. And obviously, they completely missed the February deadline that they set, and when they originally announced that February deadline, it was when they were still planning to go ahead with the CU beta. They were confident they could hit that deadline with the beta, and then they missed that deadline by about a week. I think it's very possible that the reason they missed their deadline line is because the testing took much longer than originally planned because they decided it would be much safer from a PR standpoint to test the update in private where they couldn't get laughed at for their incompetence because it was very bad PR as the line goes they were beta testing the game over a hundred days out from launch right you saw comments of that nature everywhere with lots of upvotes across reddit YouTube Facebook when they originally announced the CU beta so they pulled the beta to save face but at the cost of the MCC itself either that or setting the end of February as the updates release date was just the same over optimistic and competence that led them to launch this game in the first place. No doubt they were looking at what Battlefield 4 did with the CTE. Now Battlefield 4 took some PR heat with their CTE as well, but it wasn't damaging because Battlefield on its absolute worst day, when it was in its most broken state, it was still not nearly as bad as MCC on its best day pre-patch. That's why I think Battlefield could withstand the negative PR and Halo could not. We've gotten absolutely shit support, and obviously their management and planning is incompetent, but the PR is in fact not the result of incompetence on their part, as so many people think. It's deliberate and planned, and it's working. They don't want to talk about launch, and then they try to give the impression that the game is working. First, with the premature cutoff date for the launch compensation. To get compensated for this shitty launch, you had to have bought and played the game before December 19th. When they announce this cutoff deadline, it gives the impression that the game was fixed by the 19th, right? Because then you are no longer eligible for compensation, because why would you need to be compensated the game is working but that's a lie and a scam the game was absolutely not in a state fit for launch on december 19th it was not anywhere close to being fit for launch on the 19th but they wanted to relay the impression to anyone who had not bought the game yet that the game was fixed a week before christmas so that people would still buy the game for christmas because that's where the real jackpot is because when you hear a cutoff date for the compensation if you're not actually playing the game you'll assume that well okay the game must be ready to go now but it wasn't even close Anyone who bought this game for Christmas still got a broken game. They still paid $60 for a game that was unplayable until three months later. They should be compensated as well. The compensation date should be pushed way the fuck back, but of course they won't because that would suggest the game was broken for that long and that hurts their reputation. They want to lie to as many people as possible and convince them that the game wasn't that broken for that long. Now I brought this up on Reddit and people said, well, the consumer should have been smarter and not bought a game that was obviously broken, but it wasn't obvious. 343 did their absolute best to pretend that it was working and the game still got great reviews. Most reviewers noted that the multiplayer was buggy, but nobody explained the gravity of the situation because I don't think anybody realized it was going to be 
four months before it was playable. It got eight and nines and tens on its review scores. A lot of people got tricked and scammed into buying a defective product for Christmas, and they aren't being properly compensated so that 343 can save face on their fucking reputations. And I'd also say this, is that the argument that 343 wants to make that the consumer is stupid? for buying their product, because if so, they should say that. But otherwise, if they value any of their customers who got this game for Christmas, they would extend that compensation date to include everyone who bought a broken game. Anyone who bought this game before March 4th deserves compensation. They've gone ahead with their Halo Championship competitive tournament schedule, and the only reason publishers invest money into competitive tournaments like this is because it generates publicity, it's advertising. When they ran it before Christmas, they were intentionally trying to push a defective product. Running the HCS before this game is fixed is a PR scam, period. They continued that tournament throughout the entirety of MCC's broken four months. I think it was about giving the impression that the game was not broken. We got more updates about that tournament last month than we did about the broken game itself. And the implication that a passive, more casual observer might take away from that is, oh, the game must be fixed if they're running competitive tournaments on it, right? But it wasn't fixed. It's still totally broken. Even the pro players themselves think it's pointless propaganda. They were just trying to relay the impression that the game was running smoothly when it's just not, and that's been their goal with the HCS even before the game was released. At the competitive tournament they put on pre-release, the pro players had to deal with a bunch of the same in-game problems that would play the game for another 100 days, and the event organizers kept repeating that this was a beta build, and not to expect these issues in the main game. That was a lie. They knew it was broken. They intentionally released a defective product, and they have not admit to that yet. Because how could they have not known? Bonnie Ross says that this was all unexpected, but if this was unexpected, expected, then they must have never played the game they built, because half of all the problems are obvious from just playing any section of the game for more than 10 minutes. Campaign, Forge, Theater, In-Game Multiplayer all had significant and often game-breaking issues that you don't need to be online to see. Now granted, the matchmaking problem, the most serious game-breaking problem of all, might not have been as easy to detect, but it wasn't a traffic problem. It wasn't the kind of problem that's only detectable when you have a massive amount of people on the server. And I can't help but think if anyone in this studio had tried just once to connect to the servers, you know, it's before the game is released, turn on one of the servers, try connecting to them just one time from some other location, this game-breaking problem would have been obvious. They never once tried to connect to their own servers before the game was launched. They couldn't conduct one simple peer-to-peer -peer connection test pre-release. The dedicated server saw zero test runs, either they are monumentally incompetent or they are lying, and they still have yet to specify what exactly happened and why, and I bet you they never will. I think they were well aware of how broken it was, but they refused to delay the release. They pushed it out because they had to get it out before Christmas, because it's not just about moving copies of Halo, it's about moving Xbox Ones. There's this super intense extra layer of pressure because it's about selling the Xbox One in time for Christmas. Now this is the part where people start going on about how it's Microsoft's fault, not 343's, but as I've said before, this is an entirely pointless line of thought. 343 Industries is not a third-party developer that signed a contract with Microsoft. It is a department within Microsoft. 343 Industries is a more consumer-friendly name for the Microsoft Game Development Department. If you were pissed off about the Xbox One back in the day, did you sit around trying to calm people down by saying, hey, don't blame the people who built the Xbox One, it's Microsoft's fault for making them do that. No, you didn't, because you'd sound like a fucking idiot. And guess what? Because we all stood together and took a stand against something we didn't approve of, we accomplished meaningful change. Microsoft reversed its policies, and that's exactly what we're trying to do now. If someone punches you in the face, do you try to defend the hand because the brain was calling the shots? No, because that would be silly if a new Windows operating system comes out and it sucks ass and sets everybody's computers on fire. Do we sit around and say, hey, don't blame the people who built this program, it's Microsoft's fault? No, because that would be silly. 343 is Microsoft and Microsoft is 343. They are one and the same. They will never, and I cannot emphasize this enough, they will never, ever be separated. Yes, this fuck up was most likely driven by Microsoft wanting to move Xbox Ones, but there's nothing to gain for yourself or for the individuals you don't know, working at 343, by trying to defend the honor of these complete strangers. It serves no purpose. It accomplishes nothing because this isn't a personal issue and you're making it one. This is a conflict between an entity that sold something and an entity that bought something. That's all it is, and to spend any amount of energy trying to quarantine criticism to only a specific part of the entity that screwed us is irrational. When I say 343, I mean Microsoft. When I say Microsoft, I mean 343 because they are the entity that screwed us and they will never, ever, 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 ever be separated. So please, stop trying. The problem is you want to love the artist behind the art. You want to love 343 for the same reason you want to love the musician behind your favorite song. But this isn't about the art, this is about the transaction. You got screwed. And if you deny that in an effort to salvage the reputation of people you don't know but want to love for no rational reason other than to soothe your pathetic psychological needs, then you need to seek professional help. 
These are irrational and pointless attempts to protect a flawed psychology from the grim reality that 343 cannot be blameless in this. That is the kind of mentality that lets tyrants rise. It's the type of behavior that lets people get away with acting like assholes, and that's exactly what's going on now. I know that mentality, because when I see it in other people, I take advantage of it. I use them, and I rob them, and when I'm done, I discard them, because they are less than people. They are closer to inanimate objects with how gullible and easily manipulated they are. And that's exactly what's happening to you when you try to paint Microsoft as the boogeyman and spare the devs at 343, whose names you don't even know. Don't be that guy. And let us not forget that 343 are not the artists behind the art in this particular situation. The artists behind the best parts of the MCC are no longer part of Microsoft. They've moved on. This is about saving the art itself because it is threatened by the collective incompetence and greed of Microsoft and the usurpers 343, which are of course the same entity to begin with. They knew from the beginning that it wasn't going to be a smooth ride, but they knew they had to go through with it because they had to sell MCC, they had to sell Xbox Ones, and of course they had to sell Halo 5 in order to sell Xbox Ones next year as well. And if they had pushed back the MCC release date like they should have, then they would have been releasing it like 6 months before Halo 5, and then people would still be playing MCC when they're supposed to be moving on to Halo 5, and it would disrupt their whole plan for years to come. This is about planned obsolescence. They had to sell you MCC early enough, even though it was broken, so that it wouldn't compete with Halo 5. The entire strategy right now on their end is to ensure that the MCC launch does not disrupt their plans in any significant way. Their goal is to pull this heist off without taking any significant damage and letting the consumer bear the consequences of their incompetent, greed-driven failure. But if 343 were willing to take a hit on their profit margins, not a huge hit, not the kind of hit that turns a profit into a loss, but just less of a profit, and give this game the support it desperately needs, but more importantly that it deserves, they could save this game and it would be easy. Here's what they have to do. They need to extend the date for eligibility for the free launch compensation. There's a substantial chunk of the player base who got this game for Christmas or who got this game in January and February when it was still in a state not fit for launch and barely playable in parties. A basic sense of decency suggests these players are also entitled to some sort of compensation, but more importantly, if they receive the free compensation, they have the game, but they haven't played it in a long time, they probably haven't heard that it's been fixed, and if they have, they're probably skeptical of what fixed means. Well, that's another huge chunk of players who will be incentivized to get on and repopulate if they hear there's a huge free content update. Nothing brings people back like free shit. The cutoff date for the compensation eligibility should be March 4th, with this last huge patch dropped, because the game was not in a working, ready-to-launch state before then. And I consider the content within the compensation a slap in the fucking face. They didn't even include Firefight, which was like the coolest part of ODST, and frankly, I'm not that excited about the ODST campaign. I mean, maybe I'm in the minority here. Yes, it was a good campaign. I'm glad it's coming to the MCC, but my level of excitement for it does not even come close to matching the level of frustration and disappointment I've experienced with the MCC. And I'm skeptical of how effective this is going to be at bringing people back because I don't think it sparked the kind of widespread excitement and anticipation this game needs. The thing that made the Halo 1 anniversary and Halo 2 anniversary campaign so exciting was that those campaigns took place on the original Xbox. Most people don't still have their original Xboxes, many people didn't even have access to those first two campaigns for years, and getting to relive your childhood in HD is awesome. But with the Halo 3 and Halo 4 and ODST, I still have those games for the 360. I've been able to access those playlists at any time since I bought them. Why should I be that excited about ODST when I can just go play it on my 360 right now? Right now when I'm done with this commentary, I'm gonna go beat the ODST campaign. It's not getting remastered or anything, it's just getting ported. But porting is completely pointless, especially when it takes them this long to do it, because by the time they port it, I could have beat it 10 times over and played some firefight on my 360. And by the time they port it, nobody will be around to care about it anymore. You know? And that's why I never bought into that old argument about how we should shut up about MP being broken and enjoy the campaigns and be grateful that 343 even gave them to us. I haven't beaten those campaigns on the MCC because I already beat them several times over on the 360 and not even that long ago. If I had friends over, if I was really high just looking to have some lighthearted fun, I played those campaigns. It's cool they're on the MCC, it's not the reason I got the MCC. I got the MCC for the fucking multiplayer, which is what most people got this game for. Multiplayer is where the vast majority of players' game hours are spent because it's the end game content that keeps on giving. It was the primary appeal of the game and it didn't work for four months and we know that a majority of FPS gamers don't give a shit about campaigns. We know that on most FPS games these days most players can't get their kicks beating up on AI. We saw Respawn Entertainment come out with that study when they released Titanfall. That was their justification for why Titanfall didn't have a campaign and why Evolve didn't have a campaign. 
huge chunks of the players who are eligible for the ODST compensation aren't even going to care about it, and because of that, they aren't going to get back on to repopulate. And even the players who get back on for the ODST campaign, they aren't going to be repopulating multiplayer, which is where the population boost is needed. And it was multiplayer that was broken. We should receive multiplayer-based compensation. Mastering Relic is a slap in my fucking face. It was never a fan favorite. It was never even popular. They chose it because it was the simplest, easiest map they could bust out without having to sacrifice too much manpower resources. It's got one teleporter. It's a small circular island. It has like in total four colors, blue, brown, tan, and dark tan. It's rocks and sand and a building. It's not even compensation because everyone gets it. And even if it was compensation, it does not make up for four months of an unplayable game. So they should extend the eligibility date for the ODST campaign to March 4th. But anyone who played before that original cutoff date, December 19th, should qualify for extra compensation. Because before that update, the game was literally unplayable. You literally could not find a match. After that update on December 19th, okay, you could find matches by yourself. Party still didn't work at all. There was still a lot of restarting app and shit. But before the 19th, there was no multiplayer in the game. It couldn't even be considered in beta or alpha state. It was not ready for public consumption in any way. People who played before the 19th are entitled to free multiplayer player maps and several of them period either they can remaster more halo 2 maps relic is fine but one map by itself isn't adequate relic by itself feels like they're just doing the bare minimum to say they are providing compensation when what they need to do is actually compensate us in a meaningful way that has a tangible effect outside of PR repairs. It needs to be a compensation package that actually incentivizes all those players who have stopped playing to get back on. Relic and ODST do not accomplish that in any way. Nobody is excited about that shit. There needs to be a map pack, a free map pack. I personally would like to see Turf, Elongation, and Beaver Creek remastered for H2A. Or what actually might be easier is Halo 1 Anniversary maps. And I'm not sure why this wasn't done from the beginning, but in theory the Halo 1 Anniversary uh, should be easier to port because it's on the same engine as Halo 4 and H2A. Uh, so they don't have to deal with an entirely new engine because that engine has already been ported. And this would be useful in-game because I've noticed Halo CE is very hit or miss with people. Some people love it, but a lot of people just don't want to play it, period. I really think if they had access to the remastered version, which saw some in-game mechanical changes, as well just like h2a did to modernize it they would be much more receptive to it when it pops up in the voting screen this will increase the diversity of available gameplay and decrease the amount of people quitting out as soon as halo ce is chosen and the compensation should be delivered so much faster than it presently is on course to be 343 should have put work on halo 5 on hold just like dice did with star wars battlefront to deliver this compensation as quickly as possible they aren't going to be able to get this odst campaign out until spring by then nobody will give a shit anymore we need the kind of compensation that is going to put this game back in the top 10 most played on Xbox Live permanently. A free campaign in the spring is not going to accomplish that for more than a day. And like I said, future work on H5 should be suspended for the time being so that those developers can help work on and deliver as rapidly as possible significant in-game updates that the MCC desperately needs. We need an answer to quitting. A penalty system is only going to damage the player populations even more. We need a join in progress system like they had for Halo 4 that works across all five games. Not only would this solve the quitting problem, it would also make matchmaking wait times significantly shorter. I would recommend as a matter of fairness making those players who quit the first in line to get put into a match that has already started. We need the betrayal system to be tweaked. Call of Duty has brought out the worst in people and turned most gamers into maniacal indiscriminate douchebags who crack under the slightest pressure or hint of a challenge and resort to general anarchy to bring the rest of the world down with them. Betrayals are a serious problem. I understand why grenades and explosives hurt your teammates so that you don't spam such weapons into every gunfight you see, but bullets and melee friendly fire should be turned off. They don't serve any practical in-game purpose other than allowing players to betray their teammates for the sniper rifle and sword and whatnot. I can dodge a teammate's two grenades, but I can't do anything if he just keeps shooting me till he gets his sniper rifle. Now I realize that requires a significant amount of work, but they owe it to us. They owe it to Halo. The only moral and just thing for them to do is sacrifice profit margins. They've made money off this debacle, all right? They have made a lot of money off of the MCC. Make no mistake about it. People brought home bonus checks and shit like that. They shouldn't. They should only be making enough money to pay for the cost of building the game in the first place and bankrolling themselves long enough to push out Halo 5. Nobody should be taking home bonus checks. Nobody should be taking home royalty checks. No personal individual involved in this fucking travesty of a game should be making a personal profit off of this. That is stolen money earned through a defective product that was pushed on people aggressively and what can only be described as a scam. They even had fucking product placement on Modern Family. All profits should be put into repairing the damage they've done to this game, and it's not about the code, it's about the player populations. They need to get the whole studio on board to help out with it. They should release free maps, not as a part of a compensation package, but just in the name of repopulation. 
That's what the old Halos used to do all the time. When player populations got low, they released free maps to maintain a decent level of population. Because nothing brings people back like free shit. Halo 3 had several free maps. Halo Reach had dozens of free maps. The MCC should follow suit and release a significant amount of free maps. In fact, I think they should release Halo Reach maps. This would bring everyone back for at least a day, and if they all come back for a day, I'm confident that the beauty of Halo gameplay will retain enough of them to keep the game alive for a while afterwards. Halo Reach would be easier to port for the same reasons I was talking about with Halo 1 Anniversary. The engine is already there and half of Reach maps were just Forge creations to begin with. It needs to be free and it needs to be done now. Any paid DLC map packs would be the ultimate slap in the face to everyone who bought this game because paid DLC would further separate and dilute the players' populations between DLC owners and vanilla players and that will kill this game exponentially faster just so 343 can make more money. Release Forge maps on the MCC, release for free like a hundred community built Forge maps and make a big fucking deal about it so people actually hear about it because they haven't heard enough to believe the MCC is fixed yet, and that's on you, 343. Also, we need some serious adjustments to the playlist and map boating process. Right now, 90% of the matches being played across all the playlists are Team Slayer. The Team Slayer even gets its own playlist. It's borderline redundant. We need a Team Objective playlist. When we are in a non-game specific playlist, like BTB or Team Slayer or Rumble Pit, we need to be able to vote for the game and then get three options from each game. This provides more options in the long run. They need to implement a voting system that rejects redundancy. I don't want two or three different versions of Zanzibar or Blood Gulch as my only options. Tie votes should not go to the farthest left options. There should be a runoff between those two maps, which tied, giving anyone who didn't vote for either of those maps a chance to break the tie. And if the tie is not broken, victory should go to whichever map hit the tied amount of votes first. Each of the aforementioned steps would incrementally rebuild the playlist populations in the MCC. I realize they probably won't do the right thing and take all these steps, but even if they just took some of these steps, it could give this game a much needed boost in its relevant and useful lifespan. But we know they don't want to take any of these steps, and so the question is, how do we as a community pressure 343 to provide a massive amount of high quality support to this game when it's obvious they don't want to? I thought I would bitch my way out. Mix things up a bit. When we joined the Halo community, we took an oath. According to our station, all without exception, on the blood of our fathers and sons, to uphold Halo. Even to our dying breath. Those who break this oath are heretics, worthy of neither pity nor mercy. Even now they use the Lord's creation to broadcast their lies. We shall grind them into dust. 343 community managers, staggered press releases. They outnumber us three to one. Then it is an even fight. Fire at will, burn their mongrel hides. We must stake this fight exactly where they don't want it, on Halo 5. We must reject any and all Halo 5 advertisements until 343 brings the MCC back from the abyss. Anytime you see a Halo 5 trailer, a Halo 5 news article, a development diary, a Halo 5 in-studio tournament, they will scream, buy our game before it comes out, and you must whisper, no. Save MCC first. That's the tagline. That's the hashtag. I humbly encourage you to reply with in every tweet, video, and news article designed to sell Halo 5. Do not mention me. Do not post links to my channel or even this video. Post the hashtag, and if you feel necessary, give a quick TLDR of the video by explaining that the MCC's playlist populations have been wiped out by the four-month-long debacle of a failed launch driven by 343's incompetence, and that in a few short months, these playlist populations problems will hurt the game even worse than any broken code ever could, and that if they fail to save the game, then they never really delivered it in the first place. Save MCC first. We cannot convince people not to buy Halo 5, I'm under no illusions about this, but negative publicity can significantly damage their efforts to convince people to buy Halo 5. We can damage their ability to advertise effectively. And if this threat grows large enough, if we can throw a wrench in their plans, they will give in to our demands in order to save the franchise whose sole purpose is to move Xbox Ones. Saving the MCC does not have to hurt Halo 5. Saving the MCC can only help Halo as a franchise. The only thing our efforts can hurt are their profit margins. The more money they have to spend on saving the MCC, the less they get to take home to mama. I didn't hate Halo 5, I'm not out to try and undercut the game itself, but the transition from MCC to Halo 5, the act of sweeping the MCC and the now wounded Halo legacy under the bed where it can die while the rest of the world moves on with future super shiny Call of Halo Duty annual releases. That transition is well underway, and anyone who truly loves Halo should fear this outcome. I don't give a shit about their profit margins, and neither should you. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Not one thing to lose by sticking up for the MCC. True support of a franchise 
means tough love. If you had a friend who was tweaked out on crack and on a crack binge crashed his car into a tree and the tree fell and crushed a kitten, would you pat him on the back and say better luck next time I support you all the way, here's $60 so you can get some more crack? Or would you say, hey, maybe you should lay off the crack and drive safer next time? 343 being your friend the crackhead, the car being the MCC, the tree being the Halo legacy, the kitten being the Halo community. We need to make the prospect of abandoning the MCC more damaging to their reputation than not abandoning it. They have fixed the MCC, but now they need to save it. Otherwise, what was the point of fixing it in the first place? And ultimately, if this is about selling the Xbox, a financial sacrifice to restore the reputation of 343 and redeem Halo will go a long ways towards bringing more people onto the Xbox in the future. Saving MCC will benefit everyone on both sides of the issue in the long run. Abandoning it for Halo 5 is the same kind of short-term thinking that got us into this mess in the first place. We have to draw the line in the sand here. If 343 pulls off this heist and moves on to Halo 5 and we all forget about how terrible this launch and the last four months have been, then all is lost because every developer and publisher will look at how masterfully 343's PR people handled this situation, they will take notes, and they will be confident that they can release a game in any state at any time and contain the damage in such a way that it doesn't hurt their profits as much as it would have had they waited to release until after the holidays. The future of gaming itself is at stake here. Let our unborn children know that on this day, we took a stand in the name of gamers everywhere and for generations to come in the name of Halo and all that is good and just in this hobby that defines us. If you support the cause, please rate and favorite the video. The For The Win query of the day is that now that the entire launch debacle is over, what was your single most frustrating experience on the MCC in the last four months pre-patch and also what updates or changes would you like to see to the MCC now that it is repaired. I want to give a big thanks to my boy Tommy Koss for providing all those epic ass Halo clips you saw earlier on in the montage. His link is in the description. Be sure to check it out. And before you go, I wanted to share a clip from this 343 interview with you that I think says a lot about 343 management and the direction they are taking this series in. In retrospect, it's some pretty explosive stuff. Be sure to check it out. Thanks for watching. This is Batman, signing out.